six eights core values come from our name six eight, which comes from the Bible verse Micah six eight, which says, "Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God." So I'd like to consider today with you what it looks like to walk humbly with God as a community. Um, I'm going to sing a prayer, and you're welcome to join me in singing. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. Amen. So, uh, this was bound to come out sooner or later, and I'm just going to say it now. About a month ago, Heather and I watched the entire season two of Downton Abbey in about three weeks. And then I went back and watched the first season in four sittings. So thank you for letting me confess that. If you haven't heard about this PBS mega-hit viral sensation, it's the story of a noble family in the early 1900s, and of course, their servants. And there's intrigue and scandal among the family upstairs, and it leads to catastrophe and plotting downstairs, and so on. And one of the things that's fascinating as I'm watching, as I was watching these episodes, is how the servants speak to the family that they serve: Lord Grantham, Lady Cora, Lady Mary, Lady Edith, Lady Sylvia. And Lady Sylvia is about 18 years old when the show starts. So it's jarring to my American ears to hear the housemaid literally address her employer as my lord or my lady, as though they're almost another kind of a person. But their positions are, as rulers on the state, lord and lady of the manor, with authority over that inherited estate. So that's really what they are, a lord and a lady. So in our scripture reading for today, Paul plays on these images um, of servant and of lord, which obviously changed a little bit in the 19th centuries between Downton Abbey and Paul. But anyway, it's still kind of a similar dynamic in counseling the Christians in Rome. The problem had been coming up among them having to do with local customs. So in those days, if you wanted to meet in in public over a meal, there was no Outback Steakhouse to go to. Um, They didn't even have TGI Fridays in those days. All right. Instead, people... Thank you. All right. I guess I just have to wait for it. All right. Instead, people would go to the local temple and eat meat that had been ceremonially offered to a Roman god, like Zeus or Juno or Apollo. Which, on the one hand, if you don't believe that these gods uh, exist, it's not really a big deal. But on the other hand, to some of the Christians, it felt kind of like being an alcoholic going back to their favorite old bar. Or, I'm sorry, recovering alcoholic. Or like calling up an old flame after a couple of drinks. And I don't know why I couldn't come up with any metaphors that didn't have to do with drinking. But there you go. (laughs) The point is that for some people, the meat felt kind of contaminated, uh, compromised. It still had a meaning to it for them. And so they didn't eat it. So Paul's advice isn't, well, here's who's wrong and here's who's right. Instead he says, God is the Lord of each of you and all of you. So let it be between each person and their Lord. Whatever you do, be convinced it's the right thing and that your relationship with God is still in order. In other words, to each their own. So the idea of all all of us being servants before God flies in the face of too much hierarchy. So in downtown, Downton Abbey, all the servants eat together downstairs. And they don't really get to decide who eats with them or who does what job. Those decisions belong to the Lord. So what does this word from Paul's letter to the Romans mean for us today? There's a piece in here, I think, about having patience with other Christians, even if we're pretty sure, you know, that they are totally wrong. It is telling, after all, that Paul doesn't settle the argument by deciding whether the meat sacrificed to Roman gods is okay to eat. He says, don't judge someone else's servant. 
He doesn't decide whether the Christians should observe a particular holy day. He says, do what you think is right and be convinced about it. He doesn't say, be sure to let the other person know that you're right. He says, show respect for other people's choices. At the same time, thinking about what it means to be a church, 6-8 here, we're a church of people gathering together to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God. And in, a, in an ideal world, we are getting better at doing those things together. And in our individualistic society, there is a danger in being so siloed into each their own that we never help each other in our spiritual journeys. There is a reason that we gather. There's a reason that we do it in person. So for the last year, we've been worshiping together. I think there may be pictures of us worshiping together. Do you remember these from like two weeks ago? Awesome. Okay. Uh, so we started out worshiping monthly, and then we started weekly in February. And I've been trying to keep an eye on spiritual practices, starting with Jesus' core teachings on the Sermon on the Mount, and moving to discernment as a practice, especially around our career choices, and then prayer. And finally this summer we meditated on the Bible together and separately. And then every time we gather, we reflect on how God is still speaking, whether in the culture at large or in our own personal lives. And for me, this is a spiritual practice that is about paying attention, about watching for where God's kingdom is at work. And we have conversations together as part of worship, which has been a time when we hear about God at work in our lives and can learn from each other's perspectives and from how each of us does faith. There's flexibility here to learn from each other without the need to judge because some of us eat meat and some of us stick to vegetables, to coin a phrase. So learning to walk humbly with God means learning to do spiritual practices that put us in a place to receive and be aware of and to experience God's grace. And the idea of practices is that they involve doing something, whether that is praying each day or in the midst of a scary situation, or whether that is reading the Bible each morning or using its advice to do the right thing in a tricky situation at work, whether it's singing the hymns each week or using one to write a poem of blessing to a friend who's having a difficult time. So in some ways, this weekly worship that we do is practice for life, lived in God's realm. We're practicing together here so that we can be the church out there, having been sent out with some encouragement, some vision, and even, perhaps, a renewed experience of God's love. May God bless our journey. Thanks be to God. Amen.